Rugby Championship final round, folks. This weekend, the first game on in the Rugby Championship is the Wallabies taking on the All Blacks from the MCG in Melbourne. We are going to go through the lineups from both sides, who's in and who's out. Some stats from both sides, player stats as well. The recent results, predictions, and you guys can let us know your thoughts on how this one is going to go. These two sides are currently in very different positions at the moment with Eddie Jones kind of rejoining the Wallabies after all that time away. It's not been plain sailing. None from two, including a pretty disappointing result against the Argentinians. They would have expected to win that one at home. They've dropped to eighth in the world. They are none from two and fourth in this competition. Not going that well, but only two games into Eddie's new reign. So, um, yeah, we still expect to see something come from them. And he's had an extra week, remember, with a week rest in this competition to set some kind of trap for the All Blacks. Will it eventuate? Uh, we'll kind of have to wait and see. He's picked a few youngsters for this one, and uh, there's a few guys out injured. For the All Blacks, though, it's absolutely turned on its head with all the negativity around Ian Foster over the last few years. No, he's come out in 2023 firing. Two pretty impressive wins thus far. First in the Rugby Championship, third in the world. Potential to go to second in the world and pass the French if they get a win here. It's all coming up trumps for Fozzie, potentially at the right time. Can they maintain this? We will have to wait and see. But what they have maintained recently, the All Blacks, is a pretty good record over the Wallabies. Five zip, I make it, from the last five games. Uh, they haven't lost to the Wallabies, I think, since 2020. And that was over in Brisbane. Remember in 2021, when we still had COVID-affected games, we had those kind of back-to-back -back games at Eden Park. That was always going to be tough. And then the most recent game was also Eden Park. So take that into account. The All Blacks tend to shift it up a gear at Eden Park. So three of the last five are at Eden Park. The two in Australia, one in Perth, one in Melbourne, but not the MCG. And the Melbourne one was pretty close, 39-37. Remembering there was a wee call at the end of that one from a referee which didn't go down that well. But um, we won't dwell on that one because that one is in the past. We are looking at the match this weekend. The Wallabies have certainly made some changes. Uh, they've made one change I was kind of hankering to see. And that's at 10, but it's going to be a big pressure cooker for Carter Gordon. But we'll get to him in a second. The front row is Angus Bell, Dave Pariki, and Alan Ala Alatoa. Now, Ala Alatoa is captain this weekend. And remember... The Warriors have got two other captains and James Slipper and Michael Hooper. Well, Michael Hooper is out with a calf injury and uh, Slips drops to the bench. So they've kind of got a third captain in Ala Alatoa. But, uh, you know, he captains the Brumbies, so he's certainly no stranger to um, the extra responsibility of being captain. Nick Frost comes back in in the locking department alongside Will Scout. Remember, he played in the opening week. Didn't play in the second week, so it's a welcome return for him. Jed Holloway continues on at six. Remember, he is certainly a bit of an extra line-out option. Tom Hooper comes in at seven, which is a bit of a surprise. I mean, we're used to seeing a Hooper in the Wallabies number seven jersey, but it's not usually Tom. Remember, he only lasted about half an hour into his test debut over against the box. And Fraser McCright, I believe, has just dropped, which I find a peculiar one. I did read that he was cut rather than like injury replaced he made like 19 tackles in their last game which wasn't the wallabies top tackler but yeah and he made 20 odd meters from about four carries which i thought was a decent return but he's not done enough to retain his selection spot so it is tom hooper who's at seven and then rob baltini who's been an absolute workhorse but maybe not able to get that much go forward ball because the Wallabies haven't had that much ball uh is there at eight tate mcdermott gets the nod at nine it is going to be an interesting one to see if his combination with Carter Gordon at 10 shifts the way the Wallabies play. Remember, they've had the experience of Nick White and Quade Cooper at 9 and 10 thus far. And Nick White's been kicking the leather off the ball. He's had, I think, more kicks than anybody in this competition. So they've been kicking a lot off 9 because Nick White does have a big boot. Tate's less known for his kicking game and more known for his attacking game. And likewise, Carter Gordon is an absolute attacking threat. So whether the Wallabies are going to shift things up will be an interesting one. They, as I said, they're, they're bugger all ball. So it's a tough one to play an attacking game that Tate and Carter can give you if you don't have the position. But as I said, we will see. Uh, Samu Karevi and Jordan Pataya are your midfield. So there was a question mark. What are the Wallabies going to do at 13 with Len Ikitao out for a decent stint, like eight weeks or something? So he's done his shoulder and he's been Mr. Consistent for the Wallabies in that 13 jumper for a long time. So they've chucked in Jordan Pataya. Uh, he's had less time at the 30 years than probably he would have liked. And it's a big test for him to be stepping in there 
against uh, New Zealand, but you would have to say, in terms of World Cup experience, if the Rugby Championship is indeed just the kind of dress rehearsal for the World Cup, then having someone else have a run at 13 is probably not going to be a bad thing. Marika Korambedi and Mark Nawani Tawase are your wingers, and you do have to look out for them, because I mentioned the Wallabies have had not much ball. But if you're looking for the number one guy for defenders beating clean breaks and run meters, it's Marika Korambedi. For a team which has had no ball is very, very impressive. And then Mark Nawani Tawase on his return to the Wallabies in that last game was very impressive. Despite the fact they lost that game, he was still a standout. And also Andrew Calloway comes in for um, for Tom Wright at fullback. And I think that's a good move. Remember, Calloway missed much of the Super Rugby season, but Tom Wright just seems a little bit kind of jittery at the back. I feel like Calloway is very rarely makes a mistake. So I think that's... I think that's a welcome return for him. Bench-wise, Iwilese, Slipper, and Tupo. Taniola Tupo, remember, played for Aussie A up against Tonga a few weeks ago. So he's played very little rugby this year, but he's certainly a welcome guy to have back. Richie Arnold drops to the bench. Rob Leoda is still there. And then Nick White and Quade Cooper are still retained, but in bench spots. And then Izzy Parise is there in the 23 jumper. So he's another potential candidate for that midfield if things don't go that swimmingly with Karevi and Pattaya. If you had Parise at 12 and Karevi at 13, that is a uh, dangerous looking midfield in terms of their ability to break a tackle. It has just started piddling down. I'm not sure if you can hear that on the camera, but uh, microphone, sorry. But uh, yeah, otherwise, like stats for the individuals, man, if you're looking for the top four tacklers in this competition, it's Valentini, Pareki, Alalatoa, and Slipper. That's one, two, three, and four. But that's what happens when your team doesn't have a lot of ball. But certainly you can't fault these guys for their work rate. They're putting in uh, a fair bit against um, against the opposition. Now, for the All Blacks, they have kept things pretty stable. I am going to assume if the All Blacks win this game, they will shift things up more for Bledisloe 2 when we're at home and when the Rugby Championship is won. That's if they win this game. They are clearly not counting any chickens because they've picked... A very stable lineup. So Sam Kane is the one guy who is the kind of bigger mission. He's got a neck injury, so he is going to miss out. But you've still got Ethan DeGroote, Cody Taylor, Tyrell Lomax. That's the same front row. And they have been scrummaging really well. So that's a promising sign for the All Blacks heading into a World Cup campaign. Brody Retallick and Scott Barrett were also both really impressive against South Africa. And South Africa's got some bloody good locks, so... That's very pleasing to see from an All Blacks point of view. And they've even been able to bring in Sam Whitelock into the 23. So Tupo Vai unfortunately drops uh, to the bench, not to the bench, from the bench uh, out of the squad. But man, Sam Whitelock, what a problem for uh, for Coach Foster to have right with those three locks. I mean, Barrett's been in really good form as well. Um, Shannon Frizzell, Dalton Papali, Adi Savia, that's your back row. So Dalton steps in for Sam Kane. And I feel like Sam Kane has been the Form 7 at the moment. So that's pleasing to say, although unfortunately he's out. But it's a good chance for Dalton to kind of recapture some of that form that had him as a guy that many All Blacks fans would have preferred seeing in the 7 jumper maybe a year ago. So as I said, a good chance for him. Shannon Frizzell, though, maybe the best form we've seen him in for the All Blacks. He's the top forward for busting tackles in the competition thus far this year. I think he's second overall behind Corin Betty. So he's been in pretty devastating form. Although he does need to do it for the 80. Because I remember against the Springboks, I think he had nine defenders beaten in the first like, 30 minutes and then nothing for the rest of the game. So sometimes that's just the way the game plays out. Uh, Adi Savia will captain the side at number eight, which is maybe a back row that, as I said a year ago, many All Blacks fans would have preferred to see Instead of old Captain Kane, but Captain Kane has been in good form, so we'll miss him at, at seven. Uh, backs wise, Aaron Smith, Richie Morga continue on at nine and ten. Interestingly, the All Blacks haven't really been kicking much from nine. Aaron Smith's done very little with boot to ball. It's mostly been the ten with Bodie putting some kicks in as well. The 10 15, you know, DMAC in that first game, and then a bit of Geordie Barrett. So, yeah, it's an interesting one to see them kind of shifting things up from compared to the way that the Wallabies have been doing it. Uh, then you've got midfielder, Jordy Barrett, Rico Ioane, that's the same, same. Wingers are the same with Talia and Jordan. And then uh, Bodie Barrett's there at 15 as well. And it has been working pretty well, that All Blacks uh, back line. Where the main changes come in are on the bench. You've still got Tokiaho there, who's a great guy to be able to bring off the bench and add some impact. So 
if the Wallabies are able to bring on Tupo for some impact, you can probably counter that with a front row replacement of your own from an All Blacks point of view. Tuonga Fassi is back into the side uh, alongside Laulala, so it's an All Blues pairing for that uh, prop replacement. Sam White, like I mentioned. Luke Jacobson's finally going to get a chance, so I'm very chuffed for him because he's had a great Super Rugby season. Cam Roygaard will get his first appearance for the All Blacks if he comes off the bench. He adds something genuinely very different from Aaron Smith. He is an absolutely devastating runner of the ball. So I am very, very keen. I hope he gets at least 15 minutes. Give him 20, but it'll probably depend on how, depend on how close the game is. Anton Leonard Brown serving his suspension is back into the 23 in the 22 jumper. And then Caleb Clark, interestingly, retains that 23 spot. There's a bit of talk about him last time. Being an odd choice for the bench, as he's not really a utility, he's pretty much a specialist left winger. So I guess the All Blacks backline is flexible enough in other places that you can afford to have a guy like Caleb Clark there. There was a little bit of talk that uh, Sean Stevenson might be going to make an appearance on the bench for this one, but uh, it is not to be. Um, yeah, one interesting thing though is uh, Scotty Barrett. I mentioned him being in good form, but he has been conceding a few too many penalties. The top guy who's not a front rower for penalties considered, I think he's done four. Four in two games, which is not egregiously high, but the top guys are at five, I think. And they're both front rowers, so... Mm, needs to kind of just watch his P's and Q's. Stats-wise, for both these teams, I mentioned many times Australia has had no ball. They're averaging 38% possession across both their first two games and territory as well. So they have been kind of living off scraps. However, their run meters per carry... So when they do have the ball and they do carry it, it's great. It's 5.7. 4 is like good. Anything above 4 is good. 5.7 is great. It's the top of any of the sides. So genuinely when they're carrying the ball, they are doing it to good effect. And Corumbedi is a great example of that. But obviously they would like to have a bit more ball. And their penalty count is horrendously high. Almost like 14 penalties a game. Teams like to keep it in single digits. It's just too high. It's easily the highest in the rugby championship. So, yes, if they can get a bit more ball and if they can keep their discipline, which has been talked about for I don't know how many years now, the discipline thing, I feel like every post-match interview where they've lost, the captain is there talking again about discipline, banging your head against the wall, that one. If they can get that right, then there'll be a chance at home in front of a big crowd. But remember, there's going to be a lot of Kiwis there. Uh, a lot of Kiwis in Melbourne. New Zealand, like some great numbers. Most clean breaks, most defenders beaten, highest line-out percentage, most kicks from hand. They kick him well. Set piece is going good. The scrum looks good. And then there's the flashy stuff on top of that. So they're kind of icing on the cake. And they've made flying starts to both matches. The All Blacks have had, I think, 51 points across their two first halves, 25 points across the two second halves. So you need to watch out for this flying start from this All Black side. Uh, if there's one thing they'll be a little bit concerned about is the fact that their maul, defensive maul, has conceded tries, conceded tries in both games. And they'll be, like, they'll be, I guess, preferring to try and uh, keep the scoring a bit more consistent. They did uh, have a wee kind of, you know, second wind against the Springboks, right? When they were the Springboks pulled it close and the All Blacks pulled it back out again. So, but yeah, the All Blacks are looking pretty good thus far. I mentioned the recent results, mostly going, well, five of them going the All Blacks ways. The average score has been 41-24, so they've not been close. But as I mentioned, there's three Eden Parks in there, which are like 40-14, to 57-22, and then there's 33-25. So those kind of blow out the score lines a wee bit. How do the predictions look? Well, All Blacks are big-time favorites. Uh, 13 points with the bookies and 11 points with the rugby forecast algorithm. So the All Blacks are predicted to get this one done. If you want to get yourself some All Blacks gear in celebration of that, check out Level Rugby down in the description. They've got a bunch of All Blacks and other countries' gear, which is good to get your hands on uh, ahead of the World Cup. Level certainly has among the best selection you will find out there. They're an affiliate of the channel, so link down in the description. Uh, Wayne Barnes is the ref. It is a 7.45 local kickoff for the guys on the east coast of Australia, which I think is 9.45 in the evening for those of us here in New Zealand. So, yeah. What do you guys reckon? The All Blacks, to be too good, get a perfect record in the Rugby Championship, secure the Bledders low for another year, secure a second spot in the Rugby World Rankings. It could be Fozzie's greatest weekend ever as All Blacks coach in terms of how much stuff he will secure. Or do you think Eddie... With an extra week of planning, 
with a shift in his 9-10 combo with a new captain, with a new fullback, do you think he's going to have some kind of trap in store? You guys let us know your thoughts and um, yeah, I'll talk to you guys again soon. See you later.